Cliff's dead. Jason nearly stumbled, which admittedly wasn't that hard to do, given that he'd practically limped his way here with the rest of the survivors of Underground Attack Group 1. What well, few there were. He barely made it a few feet inside the metal fencing that delineated the outside of the mining nexus before a villa had come strutting up to him. Dead? How? He turned to look at the plant woman, who looked almost as rough as he felt. The young lieutenant looked warily over his small group of stragglers as they limped inside the perimeter before turning back to him. The Alliance pulled the same trick on us that we tried to pull on them. Only difference is, they'd succeeded. She deliberately glanced back towards the center of the base, towards a plume of smoke that was wafting carelessly into the windy skies. One of several. The cars used a nearby cave system to get close before blowing a hole basically right out from under the MCV. She paused thoughtfully. Though credit where credit is due, the Colonel didn't take the unexpected invasion of her command unit lying down. From what I saw before the generator core melted down, she and the other officers made a bloody mess of the first team into the commander center. Jason was barely listening. Most of his mind was focused on the fact that Clev was apparently dead. Just like that? The thought came to him numbly. It just seemed so anticlimactic. Wasn't there supposed to be a big battle? One that he'd actually see? Epic last words and final blaze of glory? Not this impersonal recounting. I thought we had sentries beneath us to guard against tunnelers. His voice came out as more of a croak. We did. The plant woman emphasized the past tense. Unfortunately, the Adixi are apparently better infiltrators than our people are guards. First indication we got that anything was wrong was when the sky's damn ground opened up. Jason nodded slowly. Still, not entirely sure whether they chose to retreat after the bloodbath from the NCV, or if he drove them off, but we've collapsed the tunnels beneath the facility. She paused as if in thought, which was something I suggested we do when we arrived at this dump, but you know how Clef is, or was, never eager to close a possible avenue of attack if it meant it was a possible avenue for counter-attack. She gestured to where his people had more or less sprawled out near the gate. You know, despite the fact that she insisted on you using your blue friend's tunnels as a means of egress instead, because they were better mapped. By both the Orphians and the Roaches, it seems, Jason muttered bitterly before his mind turned to the current situation. So, what's happening now? Avila shrugged, her leaves rustling. Now? Now we're just waiting for the sharks to finally move in and finish us off. Jason stared up at her in disbelief, before glancing around the perimeter. Doesn't look like that to me. I still see plenty of friendly guns on the line. Avila just scoffed before lowering her voice. Yeah, but do you see any tanks in the hard points we dug out for them? No, because we burned them all on a failed counterattack. Her eyes raked over his men. And if my eyes don't deceive me, the two platoons you left would have been reduced to maybe seven pods. Sounds a major and two lieutenants. They didn't make it. Jason answered the implied question. Despite her blasé words, he didn't miss the way Avila stiffened at his words. Of course, then she continued, with a voice that was just slightly rougher than before. So yeah, we're down from most of a regiment to maybe half a regiment and change. We've also lost our colonel and her second in command. And we're still outnumbered three to one by an opponent that's clearly got a technical edge on us. Jason moved to run a hand through his hair, before hissing in irritation as he realised he still had a spike sticking out of his arm. So, if we're as fucked as you say, he asked with gritted teeth, why haven't the guppies come in to finish us off already? Avila's eyes remained on his new arm piercing for just a moment before returning to his eyes. Strategy. Apparently back on their homeworld, the shark gals like to hunt by taking a big old bite out of their prey from ambush, and then letting it die of blood loss while attempting to swim away. So they're waiting for us to die of blood loss? Well, more like they're letting our morale dip as low as it's going to get whilst they wait for dusk. But the Turk either then or at dawn. Huh. They really are like sharks. I mean, to be certain those are the times when shimmers had to be wary of shark attacks. He nearly jumped out of his skin as a muffled crumb sounded off in the distance. Calm down, Ola said, as he half clambered to his feet. It's not a real attack, probably. What is it then? He grunted irritably, as leftover adrenaline continued to course through him. Drones. Armed drones. Admittedly, but just drones. Avetta glanced at her Omnipad. The Shards have been sending them over a few dozen at a time every few hours for a while now. We think they're trying to get an idea of our force disposition and the layout of our defences. Jason nodded slowly as he settled back down to dirt, letting out a long exhale as he did. We seemed to be a signal to the other soldiers that had been with him to do the same. Not that he really noticed. His entire focus was currently on his own needs. The most pressing of which was to lie down and hopefully not get up again for at least a day. Funny. We still don't know why they're doing this, he thought. The Imperium and the Alliance could be at war right now and we wouldn't have a clue. 
He doubted it, though. Ragnos III was too far off the beaten track to be worth anything, nor would the Guppies be bothering with even their paper-thin disguised as mercenaries. So no. While Jason didn't know the aliens' goals, he was sure it wasn't the conventional taking of territory. Ragnos just wasn't worth it to anyone, except perhaps the natives. And maybe not even to them, he thought, given just how easily the Orphan Chief had suggested surrendering her people's autonomy. So I can't help but notice, but that doesn't look like a laser burn. Jason resisted the urge to shrug for obvious reasons. It's some kind of harpoon, one that went right through my suit. He could only thank his lucky stars that the thing didn't seem to be poison-tipped. Well, he assumed it wasn't poison-tipped, given that he wasn't dead yet. Besides, I don't see much point in the slow-acting poison of the battlefield, he thought. Then again, given what Avila had just mentioned about a Dixie hunting strategy, perhaps it would be wise for him to rethink that theory. He'd be making his way to the medical tent in the minute regardless, but that little detail only made it more of a priority. Next to him, Avila hummed. Well, it seems they're putting all sorts of new tricks out of the bag today. The infiltration team had some kind of sonic weaponry. Jason just nodded disinterestedly. He'd be concerned later. Right now he just wanted to... rest his eyes. Hmm... And the tank company were talking about some kind of fusion weapon mounted on Exos. Short range, but quite... deadly. Against both Exos and our heavily armoured tanks. Apparently it turned what might otherwise have been a close battle into a slaughter. That made Jason open his eyes. You mean some of the tanks survived? Avila looked surprised, flushing a deeper green. Yeah, apparently Dorbury managed to rally a few of his people and pulled out. Against orders. Clef's given that she was still alive at the time. Jason nodded slowly. He supposed he shouldn't have been too surprised. Why didn't Friska countermand him? Avila smote a little. She tried, before getting knocked unconscious by a stray kinetic. He resisted the urge to laugh at that. Then Avila's features became far more serious. Of course, now the whole thing's turned into a standoff. MP showed up to arrest Aubrey, but the tankers are having none of it. Her leaves shivered. I think the only reason no one started shooting is because the moment Friska woke up, she started trying to mediate between the two groups. Jason cocked an eyebrow. The woman was trying to keep the peace after getting knocked out by one of her own people. It was either surprisingly understanding or dangerously pragmatic. I can't help but notice that you sound pretty unconcerned by all this. Hell, the only reason he wasn't freaking out was because he didn't have the energy to. Give him five minutes and a semi-decent meal, he'd be panicking like the rest of them. The plum woman shrugged. It's not my problem. I've got plenty of those without worrying about it. those of my superiors. Gremp can sort out that disaster. Jason felt his heart rate spike a bit. Grim's in charge? Yes. The plant woman shot him a sargonic look. And it's going about as well as you might imagine. He could imagine. He just really didn't want to. Which was a problem, because as much as this was Grim's problem, it was also his. That was the champion's job, after all. Maintaining regimental morale. Mending any rifts that might form. Be they between officers and enlisted or disparate companies. And he had no idea how to go about doing that. As if on cue, he looked over to see a Shulvanti Petty officer striding up to him. Champion Jason, your orders from Acting Colonel Grem are to report her immediately for debriefing a new assignment. Avila took one look at the other woman before glancing back at him. I'd report to the medical tent first to get yourself looked at. The woman sneered at the plant woman. The Colonel's orders were for the human to report to her. Now, ma'am. That was the moment that Jason noticed the Shill's accent. Upper crust. With a distinct aristocratic cut. More obviously, he realised she was wearing an exopiloting suit, which was essentially little different from a marine outfit, borrowing a few extra ports, hence why he hadn't noticed immediately. Well, it seems that given the discord in the regiment, Grems called in her people to add his bully boys, he thought tiredly, because of course she had. Avila glared at the woman. Pilot, I don't know if you've noticed, but the champion has a spike sticking out of his arm. He needs medical attention, not a grilling. The pilot was unmoved. My, and by extension his, orders are clear. He comes with me, now. Avila scowled, her leaves puffing up a dark red before she suddenly wilted. Report to the medical tent when she's done with you, Jason. With those final words, she marched off. To be honest, Jason didn't know why he was surprised at her sudden capitulation. It wasn't like they were friends, they were barely even colleagues. Still, just because Avila wasn't about to defend him, didn't mean he was about to go along with this. Yeah, he muttered, standing up and dusting himself off as best he could with one arm. I think I'll have that meeting with medical before going to see Gremp. Your orders were to head there now. And they were some reasonable orders. In his time underground, he might have uncovered valuable intel. 
And as busy off-putting as his injury was, it wasn't life-threatening. His suit had seen to that. Hell, it wasn't even that painful. Though that might have been combat stims and adrenaline talking. The point was, he could afford to go meet Grem before going to get it checked out. He just didn't want to. Yeah, I'm sure it can wait five minutes. Predictably, the shield didn't like that. Listen here, male! She surged forward, clearly about to grab him, when he suddenly stopped with the unmistakable whine of a weapon charging up, following by many more. Given that he was just as surprised and alarmed by the sound as the shill, Jason turned around with not a little haste, and he was greeted by the sight of not just Nora and Yarrow, but down near the entirety of Underground Attack Group 1, not quite aiming their weapons in the shill's direction. Ah, good old human social dynamics, he thought. As I said... He turned back to Shill, who was turning an interesting shade of lilac. Give me a minute. The woman glanced back and forth between him and his people, who was swearing something about traitorous aliens, and storming off. Are you okay, sir? It was one of the Marines who asked. He resisted the urge to remind them that he wasn't an officer. Not even close. He resisted it, though. I'm fine. For a given definition of the word, I'd go report him with whoever's in charge of you now before she does, though. We don't want our esteemed leader to think she's got a second mutiny on her hands. The people around him shuffled uncomfortably, as if just realising what they'd done. But they did as he said, making their way toward the barracks, or the medical tent, as needed. Which was good, because as much as he felt like suddenly throwing military discipline to the four winds on account of the regiment's no doubt imminent demise, that didn't mean he wanted everyone to do the same. Which was probably for the better, because Yara looked like she was having a mini internal freakout over what she'd just done. Nora just looked like she always did. And he found he didn't care, which he supposed was in keeping with his character. It was well established that he had stopped giving a shit about a lot of things the moment he felt his ass was on the line. And now it was very much on the line. He was going to die along with everyone else here, unless some manner of miracle happened. How the fuck are we going to make it out of this alive? He muttered. He hadn't expected an answer, which is why he was so surprised when he received one. I might have an idea... For you, not everyone else, and maybe a few of your friends. And Jason wasn't the only one whose head suddenly snapped around at the strongly accented chill. Mabel, he said slowly, taking in the familiar blue form of the Orphrian woman. What are you doing here? She shrugged. I walked in with the rest of your soldiers. I guess the gate guards didn't notice me. Either she was lying, or that was an excellent example of just how quickly military discipline in the regiment was going to shit. Mabel didn't even look slightly like a marine. She looked like a Greek hoplite. If that Greek hoplite had breasts, red eyes, and was bright blue. Not that Jason cared even slightly about that. He was much more interested in something else. You said something about a way for us to save ourselves? He asked. Naturally, the moment Maybell laid out her plan, Yara had refuted it. Loudly. You can't be serious! The wolf woman whirled on him. This is insanity. Ancestors. She might not even be telling the truth. This could just be a ruse to make up with a valuable male before the Dixie move in. Well, Jason couldn't totally argue with the latter part, even if it stung his pride. He couldn't deny that beyond him being male, his technical skills would be of value to the Orphians if they could hide him from the Alliance and the Roaches. Jason glanced over at Nor for her opinion, but the Scandinavian woman simply stood in silence. Sighing, he turned back to Yarrow. Yes, it's a risk. A big risk, but we've got to try. He gestured around with his left arm. Because we can't win this. If nothing changes, we're all going to die here. We might not, Yero shook her head. We have the home ground advantage. We still have some tanks. Our losses aren't bad, but this situation might be recovered. He shook his head. That's unlikely at best. And even if we did pull off a conventional victory, how many people would live to see it? People dying is part of the job, Yero hissed. You can't save everyone. She took a step back. This isn't the whisker, Jason. You can't just go running off and doing your own thing in search of some kind of ideal ending. Grimp isn't easy. She will execute you if you try this. She paused. And she won't be wrong to do it. A military needs to work together. Discipline alone is what allows it to function. Jason scoffed. Did you hear what's going down with our tankers? Not a lot of discipline to be had out here. Yarrow walled on him again. Then reinstate it. That's your role. I can't. Yarrow almost jumped at the sudden shout. Not that he blamed her for that. He was a little surprised himself. Just as he was surprised by the deluge of words that, even as he thought, seemed to spill forth from him. I don't know how, 
Because I got no training. No experience. Because I was shoved into this role because it was politically convenient. Because the Imperium is full of shit. Full of shitty people doing shitty jobs. Mary takes a backseat to backroom politics. So no. I can't fix this. He looked away. His shouting reduced to a bitter muttering. This isn't destiny. I don't have some secret talent inside of me. This is a shit situation that I don't have the tools to rectify. Admittedly, perhaps some small part of him was searching for an out here. He wasn't a brave man. Not in the conventional sense. Despite what people might believe, his actions have been more born of desperation than bravery. More to the point, he didn't want to die in some insignificant mud ball for an empire that he didn't care for, and that didn't care for him. But if what Mabel is saying is true, I might have a shot at really fixing all of this. Yarrow is sad before seemingly taking another attack. Then take it to Grimp. Get her consent for this. You think she'd agree? After I just sent her little goon packing? He laughed. She'd dismiss it out of the hand, even if she wasn't already focused on getting Dobby and his people back under control. Yarrow actually growled, stomping back and forth. Then she seemed to come to some kind of resolution. And with it, a certain sadness seemed to wash over her. Perhaps you're right, Jason. She stood up to her full intimidating height. But that's not your call to make, it's Grimps, and she has the right to make it. So you're going to meet with her, and you're going to explain this plan of yours, one way or another. Jason's heart seemed to seize in his chest, as the wolf woman advanced on him. Don't do this, Yarrow. He took a step back. Then another. And another. He had no way of fighting her off with his arm out of commission. Hell, he didn't know if he could fight her off if he were in peak condition. I'm sorry, Jason. Lewin seemed to wince at his words, but she didn't stop her advance. You will leave me little choice. A pack cannot survive alone the operator. You need to trust the system to work. I will take you to Grimp, and we will explain- Then she dropped, like a puppet with her strings cut. 